So our next speaker, Kim Perry, who himself is from Saudi, is going to be telling us about innovative approaches towards the control of a major threat to the production of many important vegetable crops. Now Kim tells me that he's a bit of a nerd with a net and frankly I can't disagree with that. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Yes, yes, correct Chris, I'm a complete nerd with an insect net. But I'm not the only one at the Wake campus. There are quite a few of us in the Saudi entomology group uh, that work on various insect pests. And we also have some really good researchers working on native bees at the University of Adelaide. And as uh, you'll hear now, the farming community also has quite a few nerds with insect nets. Now, for as long as humans have grown crops for food, those crops have been attacked by insect pests and also weeds and diseases. So in order to eat, we've had to find ways to protect our crops. During the last century, pesticides have made it possible to produce a lot more food crops globally. We often prefer other methods of control, but sometimes we do need to use insecticides to control outbreaks of insect pests. But some insect pest species have the ability to become resistant. So today I want to talk to you about how insecticide resistance in insect pests directly impacts the way your food is produced, but also one way that scientists are working on managing this problem. So if we have a thorough understanding of how uh, our insect pests interact with their environment and what conditions lead to outbreaks, we can use this information to develop more strategic methods of control with less pesticide use. And clearly this has major benefits for producing our food uh, more sustainably with less impact on the environment. So here at The Way, myself and colleagues are working on a, a major insect pest, the diamondback moth, and, and here it is in the jar. This little moth is the world's most destructive pest of brassica crops. These include vegetables like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower and kale, the same greens you're told to eat every day, and the so-called superfoods. Brassicas also include canola crops, which are grown for the oil in the seeds, which you cook your food in, and spread on your bread in the form of uh, margarine. So this little moth, this very moth, costs the world economy more than $5 billion each year in damage and the costs of trying to control it. And for that, you could buy more than five Queen Mary II ocean liners every year. So you're probably thinking, well, you've got it there in the jar, why don't you just get rid of it? Well, as it turns out, unfortunately, this isn't the only one. <laughs> Here are a few more. And you won't be able to see them because they're quite small. But there are quite a few caterpillars of the diamondback moth on that cabbage plant and that canola plant. So this little moth is very little and very insignificant looking. Why is it so damaging? Well, it turns out that this moth has a few features that make it particularly successful as a pest. So first of all, it can fly very long distances. Actually, the moths themselves are quite weak flyers and they won't fly very far on their own, but when their food runs out, they can use wind currents to migrate many hundreds or even thousands of kilometres. Radars have actually detected the diamondback moth migrating across parts of Europe. The host plants of the diamondback moth are quite short-lived and the moths need this ability to regularly move to new plants looking for food. And this is how they invade crops. Secondly, the diamondback moth can reproduce very quickly. So a single female moth will lay about 400 eggs in her lifetime. And in warm weather, the entire life cycle can be completed in about two weeks. Now, in a canola crop, a farmer will keep an eye on the number of caterpillars in his crop using a sweep net. And this is a pretty shabby example because it is a working sweep net. All right, so what he'll do is take a sample of 10 sweeps. During an outbreak, the number of caterpillars can exceed more than 1,000 per 10 sweeps. That equates to about 600 per square metre or about 6 million per hectare. Now, here I've placed the equivalent number of caterpillars on these plants, and you can't really see, but they've only been there 24 hours, and you're already seeing holes in leaves. The caterpillars will basically completely strip the green material out of a crop, so that your... Uh, now, if, if they were on there for one or two weeks, imagine what they could do. Well, your crop would go from looking like that to looking like that pretty quickly. Now, imagine... If these plants were your bank account, like they are for a farmer, 
You would do anything to protect it. You were basically watching your livelihood being eaten away before your eyes. Now imagine there was actually very little you could do about this. And this brings us to the third feature of the Diamondback Moth success. It has the ability to rapidly become resistant to insecticides. In fact, the Diamondback Moth has become resistant to more than 90 different insecticides around the world. More than almost every other insect. So how does resistance work? Well, think of your friends. Some are tall, some are short, some drink cappuccino, others drink macchiato. And everyone knows at least one person that wants to drink soy skinny latte. <laughs> so everyone is different. So like all animals and plants, insects carry genes that can vary. Some insect pest species carry genes or gene mutations that make them insensitive to certain insecticides. In a population of insects, some individuals will carry these resistance genes and others will not. When an insecticide is sprayed, the individuals carrying resistance genes are more likely to survive than those that don't. The survivors can then breed and pass their resistance genes onto their offspring. This means that the next generation now has more resistant individuals. So while not every species has the ability to become resistant or to evolve resistance, for those that do, every spray can actually make the problem worse. And this scenario describes the diamondback moth problem very well. It creates a vicious cycle of overuse. So you can see that insecticide resistance is a major issue for farmers and consumers. Farmers need to be able to produce a crop and consumers want food produced with less pesticide. So what can we do about this problem? Well, clearly we need to find more strategic ways of managing insect pests with less uh, insecticide. If we could use a range of different control tactics that complement each other, rather than relying on just a single tactic, it's possible to achieve good overall suppression of insect pest populations. In biology, we call this integrated pest management, or IPM. And it's a major goal because it reduces pesticide use and leads to more robust ecosystems in crops and better food. So scientists around the world are working on a range of different non-chemical control strategies for the diamondback moth. One of these is developing host crop varieties with built-in resistance or tolerance to the diamondback moth, either through traditional plant breeding or gene editing. Another approach is to encourage uh, predatory or parasitic insects that occur naturally in crops and feed directly on pests and keep their populations down. But the diamondback moth is a very challenging insect. It's unlikely that any one method of control will completely solve the problem. And so insecticides are likely to remain an important tool in the toolbox for farmers heading into the near future. This means that we need to look after our pesticides by not overusing them. So what if we could forecast an outbreak? How would that help? Well, early warning is actually a really useful tool in pest management. It allows time to prepare. A smaller problem is usually much easier to deal with than a larger problem. And just think of a house fire, for example. A house fire always starts small in one place. Um, very easy to put out that kitchen fire, probably with a fire blanket. But if you leave it an hour or two, you're going to need fire trucks and helicopters to sort it out. Alternatively, if we knew that the risk was low, we could avoid wasting effort, cost and insecticide, controlling the problem when we didn't need to. So early warning really helps us decide when we should and when we shouldn't use insecticides. Here at The Wake, myself and colleagues are working on understanding how populations of the diamondback moth move across the landscape and invade canola crops. And we need this information to be able to develop forecasting ability. So every year in Australia, farmers plant canola and every year the diamondback moth arise in those crops, but outbreaks only happen in some years. We want to know where the moths are coming from, when they arrive, and what conditions lead to outbreaks. So studying the migration of insects that move around a lot is very challenging. The insects will often take off in one location, immediately become diluted in the airstream, and get carried in an unpredictable direction. And so the movement patterns of the diamondback moth are not well understood around the world. So we're using a range of approaches to tackle this issue. Firstly, we're using genetic markers to understand how often individuals from one location breed and exchange genes with individuals from another location. And our genetic markers are telling us that populations of diamondback moth from right across Australia are regularly interbreeding and exchanging genes. So they're all moving around a lot. But these data don't really tell us uh, 
their directions of movement. So we're also directly monitoring flight activity in canola crops. We're working with uh, volunteer farmers and agronomists to run a network of traps across a large region of South Australia. So each volunteer adopts a single canola paddock and monitors it regularly to understand how many moths are trapped in a given time period. And by doing this across a large area, we can use models to try and understand where the moths may have come from. So for this, we use uh, two types of trap. We use a pheromone trap that looks like this. It contains a white sticky base in it and the female moth sex pheromone. So the males, unsuspecting males, will fly along, go in there looking for a good time and come to a sticky end. Not that unusual when you think about it. We also use light traps to attract and capture unsuspecting females as well as males. And let's try something tricky. Oh, look at that. So what girls wouldn't like that? We know girls love lights. <laughs> so by taking this cooperative approach, we're gathering important new data on the movement patterns of the diamondback moth and in doing so, improving our forecasting ability. We're catching the diamondback moth in the act of invading our food crops. So I'll bet that the last time you sat down to eat your uh, cabbage, cauliflower or broccoli, or cook a steak, you weren't thinking about nerds with insect nets protecting your crop. The next time you will. Thank you.